Good morning, everybody. Thanks for spending another Wednesday morning with us. Uh, today, we have Johnny Thompson with us from Aegis. Johnny, you want to give a wave? Uh, and the rest of us are from Peerless, and we are going to discuss Teflon line pipe and valves 101 and fluoropolymers in general. So with that, we are going to remove our faces from your, your face, and we're going to get going on it. All right, once again, we're going to talk about Teflon line, pipe, and valves. So if you look around the room today, we got, again, a bunch of uh, great, great customers. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> um, from many different industries and many different regions, uh, as far away from Germany as well. Uh, and Aegis down here is out of the Geismar, Louisiana area. And Johnny, who's uh, presenting today, is from the Mobile, Alabama area. So again, a little bit about Peerless. We started in 1914 as a general mill supply. We've certainly evolved over the years um, to become a go-to source for processed components. We do operate in three distinct um, segments. Our process division works with chemical, pharmaceutical, uh, food and beverage, really the plant environment, working with operators to make sure that we help them maintain safety, reliability, uh, always with an emphasis on better, safer, faster, cheaper. The Procore division works with OEMs and equipment builders uh, really to help them navigate some of the more challenging requirements that the end users continuously uh, seem to be adopting globally for a lot of uh, capital projects. We have our high temp fabrication division that works with scientific surfaces. We do mold machine to print, uh, laboratory casework and high temperature insulation product. So today we have Johnny Thompson, as mentioned, there he is uh, with Aegis. We also have Sidney Rivera, he's the engineering manager with Aegis. From Peerless, we have all the same folks as uh, you've seen every week now, Dan, Greg, and me. Uh, I asked a little bit about Johnny. I've known him for a few years and he is a college football fan. If asked, he will tell you he is a diehard Alabama Crimson Tide fan. Uh, but if you look closer, I'm wondering if he really is an Alabama fan. Sure does seem to surround himself with a lot of purple and gold, and I'm sure he blames that off as Mardi Gras colors. I don't know, though. I'm thinking he might be a, a, a deeply rooted LSU fan, so we'll let Johnny speak to that. But uh, anyways, I am going to turn it back to Dan Morgan, who's going to address, uh, address the platform for today's meeting. Dan, take it away. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Kev. Uh, I'm just going to take control here for a second, and I will show you guys just a couple of housekeeping items, um, introduce you a bit to the controls that you're seeing in front of you and what they do. Um, so in the control panel, um, if it's in the way of your screen, you can use this uh, orange arrow to collapse it and it'll minimize the panel. Um, you can toggle in and out of full screen mode using this button. Um, some audio settings if you're having any trouble, um, although if you're having trouble, you probably won't be able to hear me explain this. So that might not be very useful, but there it is. Um, and most importantly, down here, you'll see the questions panel. So um, as Johnny is working his way through his presentation, um, if you guys have any questions at all, um, you know, if you need more information, you want some clarification on something, you have maybe an application specific question you want to you want to ask, uh, please use this question panel to type out a question. Um, and that's what I'll be doing in the background here is keeping an eye on those questions and I'll be finding moments to interject those questions into Johnny's presentation uh, to make sure we get some answers for you guys. Um, at the end of the webinar, um, if you did ask a question and you want to um, kind of have a record of that or see the response and how we answered it, um, you can file, uh, save questions in chat log, um, and export that log for your record. So, um, yeah, ask away, please. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to turn this over to Greg, who will be driving the presentation for Johnny. So um, here you go, Greg. Perfect. John, you ready to take it away? I'm ready. You guys ready? All right. Yep. yep. Uh, thank you guys and uh, and for Kevin there, Roll Tide. Uh, a little bit about Aegis before we dive in. Uh, you know, we really focus on the chloroalkali industry. Uh, we started in 2002. Uh, our main focus is on line valves and line pipe systems. We are a member of the Chlorine Institute and our valves are compliant with pamphlet six. 
we are known for high quality and reliable products and deliver that at a, a very uh, competitive price point. Uh, we also take great pride in, in customer service. Uh, we know when a plant needs a valve, a lot of times they need it yesterday. So, uh, so in order to service the customer, we must carry inventory. So there's, there's no long lead times. We, we carry about eight to $10 million uh, in inventory at, at any given time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a pretty significant amount there. Uh, we also try to turn around quotes the same day. Uh, and like Kevin mentioned, our main facility is in Geismar, Louisiana. Uh, but we also have a facility in the Houston area to uh, service the Texas market. Okay. A uh, little history of Teflon. Uh, you know, it was discovered by complete accident by Roy Plunkett. He was working at DuPont, which is now Camores. Uh, he was essentially working with refrigerants. He compressed them, and out the other end came PTFE. Uh, just like the story of how champagne was discovered by accident, uh, so was Teflon. Uh, you know, really, this is one of the most revolutionary inventions of our era. You know, it was it was discovered 100% by complete accident. Uh, and also, just a, a little fun fact here: in 1985. Roy Plunkett was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame with the, with the likes of Thomas Edison and the, and the Wright brothers. So uh, pre pretty good company to keep there. Uh, history of Teflon. Uh, let's, let's look at the history or, or a timeline of how all these uh, polymers came to be. Uh, so Teflon was invented in 1938, but not trademarked until uh, 1945. So they tinkered with it for, for about seven years. Uh, then they go commercially selling it about uh, 1946. Uh, then following that, we have FEP about 1960, which is uh, kind of, uh, it's kind of similar to PFA. Uh, then you have ETFE, which is Tesla, 1970, PFA in 1972, and uh, TFM, which is considered uh, paraflon, was uh, invented around uh, 1994. Growth of the uh, Teflon market from DuPont, now Camores, you have all these other spinoff of companies making all these various kinds of Teflon. Dining on uh, that one for the, for the most part is what we are utilizing. That's what Paraflon is, TFM. Uh, you also have Asahi, Daikin, and uh, Soul Bay. You have all these uh, facilities with, with multiple sites throughout the world that are, that are making, making Teflon. Uh, a couple of uh, players in the, the modified PTF uh, E range. Uh, one thing to note is, is the chemical makeup of Teflon. It's, uh, it's simply a long chain with fluorine molecules orbiting around the, the carbon. Uh, this is the, the strongest bond in chemistry, uh, carbon and fluorine. Uh, when you go to the, the modified PTF E, it, it looks exactly like PFA, and the only difference is the oxygen atom that has been added to it. You can see it on, on the bottom there, the, uh, the oxygen atom. Uh, the, right here, these are uh, some of the players that, that are manufacturing PFA. Uh, one thing to consider, uh, you know, most of the companies or manufacturers are going to be kind of secretive with, uh, with their Teflon blend. Uh, growth of the of the Teflon market. Uh, so, so the Teflon market. What are the, what are the driving factors of it? Obviously, chemical processing. You have automotive engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, semiconductors a huge piece. Uh, aerospace and consumer goods. Uh, so, I think we all have uh, you know nonstick pans at home. So, you have some of the most deadly chemicals to cooking eggs in the morning. It is uh, currently a $2 billion industry for the resins that these facilities are using. It's estimated it will be 2.6 billion by the end of this year, 2020. And uh, again, the main driver is the semiconductor industry in the Asian market. Uh, TFM formulation or, or paraflon. All of these polymers are going to stem from, from PTFV. They are all going to go through the same process and then they, they make small, minute changes. Uh, in, the, in the case of TFM, they are adding what is considered a modifier. It is a PPVE. 
and this is the exact same one that goes into the process of making PFA. Uh, it is going to be uh, at, at a lesser concentration for, for the TFM, it's going to be uh, about 1% concentration. And the end result would give you a, a component of Teflon that has similar properties to both PTFE and PFA. It's, uh, it's kind of a hybrid, if, if you will. Uh, one thing that's important to know with PPVE is that uh, this modifier specifically inhibit, inhibits crystallization and maintains uh, amorphous crystalline ratio, and, and we'll get to that in uh, later slides, uh, but that, that's important to know. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is how it, it's going to maintain the, the PTFE mechanical prop, uh, properties. Uh, the, the PPVE is also the, the number one driving factor for the, for the reduction of cold flow, and I'll show you how that works later as well. Uh, the results of, of this chemistry is it's, it's not melt processable, uh, you know, kind of similar to PFA. Uh, this material is going to be uh, powder-like resin, just like PTFE. We're going to go through the, the same manufacturing processes of the original form of, of, of Teflon. So you're going to take uh, you're going to take these powder resins and mix with the lubrication to them, and then it will go into uh, a centering process. Uh, it will then be put into a mold of, of some shape, some geometry. Uh, you'll have compression, pressure, and, and, and heat will be applied to it, and essentially during this process, you're going to get uh, get it as close to the liquefaction stage as you can without actually surpassing liquefactions, because PTFE and paraflon cannot go into a liquid phase. It, it's not melt processable. Uh, so, you know, if this happens, it will immediately gas off. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna take it all the way up to that border to where all these powder resins gel together essentially. Uh, now, what makes Paraflon unique is it has a, a lower melt viscosity. Uh, so these particles, they, they begin to diffuse to, uh, and center together at, at lower temperatures than, than PTFE. Uh, that again is accountable to the uh, PPVE modifier. And the end result is, uh, is a more dense product. Uh, so that's where permeation rate comes in, uh, su superior permeation when we look at, at paraflon to the, to the original uh, PTFE. Uh, now, there are two facets uh, to cold flow. This is what we talked about a little earlier. This is uh, the elastic modulus, which is the, the amount of force you have uh, to apply to a given substance before you result in deformation of it. Uh, so before, before you cold flow this item, it has, it, it's how much force can it handle? Uh, one thing to see here is, is uh, the, the pressure on the left side and the temperature along the, the bottom. It takes more pressure at the lower temperature to start to deform the TFM, but as the, as the temperature climbs, the TFM really starts to separate itself. Uh, so another aspect of cold flow is essentially the, the deformation under load. This is uh, more in line with the, the type of memory that Teflon is going to have. Uh, so, so once you deform it, then they will, will let it relax. It's, it's how much relaxation comes into play. Uh, so in this case, they put 100 hours of load on the Teflon samples, uh, PTFE and, and TFM. Uh, they did a, a couple different varieties here, uh, glass field and carbon field. But uh, let's specifically look here at the uh, at the virgin because the, the industry we are in, we are we're going to have we're not going to have any of the uh, uh, any of the field forms of Teflon for the most part. Uh, so they'll take the load off and let it relax for 24 hours, and then they'll measure it and. Uh, as you can see in the virgin PTFE resin, you have uh, over 10% of deformation after it's given uh, uh, time to relax. Uh, the TFM actually self-healed to a certain uh, degree, just 4% deformation. Okay. Uh, 
permeation rates. It uh, here it shows uh, that TFM is uh, superior when it comes to, to permeation with uh, with these types of chemicals, even at the at elevated temperatures. Uh, here you you see you have uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrochloric acid, and uh, chlorine. These are, are, are some of the, the applications that we we deal with on a on a regular basis in the chloroalkali industry. Uh, one, one thing to note is we have reached out to uh, different suppliers trying to get a chart of the PFA uh, to compare with, uh, with the PTFE. Uh, and like, like I mentioned, a lot of people want to keep, keep it close to the vest so they don't, you know, it's, it's hard to get that kind of information. But we do know that PFA is uh, about three times the cost of raw materials, resin. Uh, so, uh, but, but if you look at the, the PT chart here comparing PFA, it, it is in, it's, it's in our favor here. Uh, TFM is the better option. So at elevated temperatures, you can see that the rapid decline, and uh, you know, just shows that the paraffin is is a superior product here. And you notice the vacuum in, in blue across the bottom and pressure temperature across the top here. Uh, so so you know, in in the high uh, high temperature, high vacuum applications. Uh, if you look at this chart uh, based off the, the materials, you know the TFM stands the best chance. Uh, TF, TFM is very suitable for, for these types of applications here. Uh, this is a diagram. Uh, you can see the, uh, the PFA formulation. It's, uh, you can see the, the oxygen molecule here in red on the carbon chain with the fluorine atoms around it and uh, a PPV modifier added to the original PTFE formulation. Uh, this has uh, two to three percent concentration, uh, so you know out the other end will come uh, PFA. And, uh, that's about as much as, as you're going to get. They're very secretive about it, but uh, but in the gist, this is how you create PFA. Uh, the result of of that is it's uh, completely melt processable. Uh, we can go and mold this into unique geometries. You can mechanically lock the liners in place. Uh, it has the highest permeation resistance due to the lack of voids and, and overall density. One thing to note is how important it is to be able to mechanically lock a liner in place. Uh, it's important for tolerances associated with the valve. You know, after you line a valve with PFA, you have to go in and machine critical dimensions. If you don't have your liner locked in place, your liner can move. It can cause, you know, cause issues with that. So it's critical for the valve to have dovetails or grooves to lock uh, lock the liner in place. Uh, not locking, you know, the liner in, in, can cause shutoff issues, you know, and, and other things associated with that. And we'll get into that more detail uh, when we start when we show the valves. Uh, you take, uh, this is the PFA uh, molding process. You take the PFA pellets, uh, you heat them up, you know, equally as important, you take the, the, the bow body and heat that up as well. Uh, and you take the internal tooling. Uh, so you have the, basically you have the bow body, the tooling goes in and that, that's going to, to control the bore diameter of the bow. Uh, that way you don't have have a lot of PFA waste that uh, you know, that you're going to have to machine out. Uh, and then they basically they're going to heat it up in an oven. They want the PFA pellets and, and the valve body at the same temperature level or close to it because the, the 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 rate of cooling of the PFA is going to create different chemistries and structures within the Teflon. Uh, so you so you have to control it the best you can. Essentially. Uh, how they do that is, is, is get everything the same temperature, and then you can control the cooling as it goes through the, you know, the process. Uh, so then the bow body is, uh, is put under a transfer molding ram. The PFA is injected into it, and at that point, in these big bats, uh, they fill with water, and, and the bow stays under the ram, and that's, that's your cooling agent. There's a, you know, and there's a given rate of associated uh, with that, and we'll go go more into this on, on you know upcoming slide. Uh, but as they cool it off, they are keeping the the molten PFA 
you know, constant pressure on it because it's it's just like a bow body casting where if, uh, if you cool it off too fast or too quick, you get shrinkage, porosity, uh, stress cracks, and uh, you know things of that nature. Uh, so they keep the molten PFA pressurized and then go through the the whole cooling process. Uh, it, it's really a, a pretty simple process, but there's a lot of craftsmanship involved. Uh, this is the uh, core competency of, of all these companies is their ability to effectively uh, do this over and over and over again. Uh, this is the reason that uh, India and, and China haven't taken over the, the manufacturing of, of PFA line valves because they're, you know, there's so much that goes into the ability to replicate it consistently at, at the same level of quality. You know, for instance, uh, you have to consider the, the energy grid, you know, especially in India, it takes a lot of energy to, to do this process. And if, if they have, or if they're, if they're constantly going down or losing power, the temperatures are fluctuating and uh, you, you won't get uh, consistent results that way. Uh, here you have amorphous versus uh, crystalline. Uh, these are uh, the types of structures within Teflon. You know, so Teflon solidifies into to these two, two structures. Uh, amorphous lacks a clearly defined shape or form. It's uh, lacking an overall structure. Uh, crystalline has a clearly defined shape or form, and it's uh, crystal-like. Uh, these numbers here, amorphous 67% is, is, is from one of the, our sister companies, Richter, I imagine you know these, these numbers can can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but in their PFA, 67% uh, of the overall Teflon accounts for the amorphous component of it. Uh, this is essentially the quicker you're going to cool it down with the water or whatever your cooling agent is, the more amorphous it will become. Uh, these structures are about 13% larger, therefore they they are responsible for for any of the porosities uh, that exist in in PFA. Pros and cons, that's a con. Uh, the pro is uh, the flex flexibility that allows PFA to have a have good mechanical properties that uh, are associated with, uh, with this structure. Uh, and, and visually, it's uh, considered to be transparent. Uh, crystalline, 33%. Uh, uh, the slower you, you cool the component down, the more crystalline, the more perfectly shaped structure are going to take place. This is going to be responsible for PFA, you know, PFA superior permeation. Uh, those structures not only are, are, are they orderly, but they are very tight, they're very close, and this minimizes the amount of porosity in between them. Uh, and this, this type is, uh, is visually milky. Uh, so here's a slide that is uh, essentially a component of PFA. Uh, they shaved it off, they put it under a microscope, uh, and you can see the crystalline structure is very uniform. The amorphous kind of a hodgepodge, you know, all mixed together. Kind of, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. Uh, then you have uh, different types of permeation. Uh, you know, so now that we know, uh, you know, the types of Teflon, let's, let's talk about the types of permeation. Uh, you know, like I said, there's, th there's three types. Uh, and essentially, the, the first type is going to be based off the overall density of, of the Teflon, whether it's PTFE, TFM, or PFA. Uh, you'll have very small uh, molecules such as helium that can permeate through PTFE and PFA because the uh, molecular makeup or size is so incredibly small. Water and carbon dioxide can migrate to PTFE and PFA as well. This is something we do as, as well as our suppliers. Uh, there is a significant testing done with helium to approve our raw material supplier. You know, we want to see if, uh, if there's if there are going to be any porosity issues. Uh, this is not solely for helium, uh, water, and, and carbon dioxide. It's really anything that can migrate through cracks. Uh, stress cracks and processes with, within these uh, materials. Uh, so for the, for the most part, this is associated with if it's a perfectly made piece, the only way it can permeate through it is if, uh, you know, if they're with these particular molecules here. Uh, 
So type two, this is uh, specifically for our industry. Uh, this involves uh, chlorine and bromine. Uh, the way this works is uh, we look at the molecular structure of Teflon. We said it's a carbon chain with fluorine atoms. Very common that these fluorine atoms jump and actually switch place with each other, and not only on the same carbon chain, but other carbon chains as well. Uh, fluorine is always moving, so uh, when you take the chemicals that are similar to fluorine, like fluorine, bromine, for example, they can, uh, they can actually uh, replace the fluorine atom and leapfrog their way through the Teflon structure uh, until they actually permeate all the way through. Uh, fluorine and chlorine are in the same housing group. They are going to, to have the same charge, so they are essentially interchangeable with carbon. Uh, they both have the, the same affinity uh, to the carbon atom, so uh, that, that's why they are able to, to leapfrog. Uh, so eventually, even if these molecules are too large to permeate through the, the Teflon, maybe not as small as, as a helium, uh, but uh, the, the type one does not apply in, in theory. Uh, well, type two eventually with, uh, with this will, will eventually happen over time. That's why we say all types of Teflon over time will, will eventually permeate. Uh, this here is uh, type three. There are uh, three different types of permeation. This is more due, uh, type three is more due to uh, poor manufacturing techniques. You got cracks, voids, uh, the movement of material, and general flaws. If, if a supplier is inferior in their manufacturing processes or poor QC measures, uh, you're going to have inherent problems like uh, your Teflon and, and your permeation rate is going to be poor. Uh, so it's the, the porosity of it, if it's, if it's made perfectly, it's the swapping of the fluorine atoms, and then it's uh, essentially if, uh, if it's made very poorly. Those are, those are your permeation types. And your permeation rate factors. Uh, first is the uh, Teflon thickness. Obviously, uh, that has a component in here on how, how long it will take to, to permeate through. Uh, our supplier claims that uh, at some point that the permeation rate will plateau out, meaning that uh, as the Teflon gets thicker, the permeation rate does not necessarily uh, decline. Number two is uh, temperature. You know, we all know temperature will increase permeation, but why? Uh, for, for one, the, the process fluid becomes more soluble so it can uh, migrate easier through the Teflon. There's an increase in rate of, of swapping the atoms of the uh, fluorine atoms at the higher temperature. You know, therefore the, the you know, chlorine atoms can move in and out at, at a quicker rate. Uh, also the Teflon actually increases in volume at higher temperatures. Uh, so so any, any voids or air pockets are, are gonna grow and expand as well too. Uh, pressure has a place in this talk. Uh, the uh, increase in pressure will, will obviously give uh, increase of rate of permeation. And last, the, the process fluid concentration level, the, the higher the concentration level, the higher the, the rate of permeation. Uh, you know, and of course this depends on, on, on what the process fluid is. Things we deal with, uh, like HCL, is, it's very hot application and HCL at, at a high concentration has one of the highest permeation rates that we deal with. Uh, so, so why should I use a line valve versus, versus a non-line valve? Uh, you have a wide range of chemical, re chemical resistance here. Uh, there's the corrosion resistance aspect. And it's also going to be a lot less expensive than alloy metals such as Hathaway, Monel, and Inconel. Uh, you know, what are some of the applications for line valves? Some of the, the applications we deal with, you know, you have a whole list of, of acids, uh, alcohols, brines, gases, uh, you know, gases such as uh, chlorine, and phosgene, uh, BCM, and deionized water. Uh, where should I avoid using uh, Teflon line valves? Uh, we want to stay away from cryogenic service. 
uh, in any service that's going to be below uh, minus 50 degrees F, and also any service where temperatures exceed uh, 450 degrees F. Uh, and also services with uh, abrasive media should be avoided as well. Uh, at, at A, just like I mentioned earlier, we have a full line of Teflon line valves and pipe. Uh, you know, we have, uh, here's a list here, we have, you know, ball valves, both full and standard port, uh, butterflies, uh, but bellow seal globe, diaphragm, plug valve, sample valves, and uh, high performance line pipe and, and fittings. Uh, this here is our LBF. It's a uh, Teflon line full port ball valve. Uh, you have the, the option to, to fully automate or, or have it as a, as a manual valve. Uh, you notice the, the valve on the right has a stainless steel uh, handle. There we go. Uh, this is uh, standard and it's, it's uh, very robust, so it gives a customer, it's going to give you greater uh, resistance you know, in, in the dem demanding environments that we. Uh, that we work in. This is a cutaway look of, uh, of the standard LBF. Uh, we have a, a live loaded stem sealing system and it's uh, maintenance free design. You see here we have uh, up top, we have Belleville springs or, or washers that, that give us our, our sealing force. Uh, you know, there are no, no packing gland bolts which can corrode or become brittle over time with this valve. Uh, a little story about this, uh, we had a plant that ordered 34 inch LBS from our website. Uh, they, they bought them to, to put an HCL service and uh, when we followed up with them we, we found out they had problems with uh, one of the uh, one of our competitor valves uh, that actually uses packing gland bolts to, to uh, get their stem seal and they had an issue with the, the bolts breaking off and, and they had some serious leaks. You know, what made them, them come to us uh, was an incident where two of their technicians were out, they were tightening the bolts down, they broke off, and uh, they were exposed to, to the chemicals and uh, both were, were hospitalized. So this is, this is also a safety, safety feature here. Uh, you can you notice uh, here on the stem, we have uh, one U-cut packing set on the standard LBF, and I'll talk more about that uh, on the next slide. You also have a you have a one-piece ball and stem, so this eliminates any slop or hysteresis between the ball and stem. You know, a lot of our competition still has uh, a two-piece ball and stem, so where the ball and the stem meet, the Teflon, the two-piece will actually stretch and, and even tear. So this will allow the, the media to attack the, the ball and stem and basically you know, destroy your valve. Uh, you also have uh, right above the packing set, you have uh, a leak detection or monitor port. You can, you know, a lot of plants will put a sniffer system or pressure gauge on it to check it. And this, this lets us know if there's a leak so we can eliminate any risks there. Uh, this this uh, LBF has the SDS package. So the only difference between this one is there are two U-cup seals or, or, or packing sets. Uh, the U-cup is, is, is uh, let's go back to that. The, the U-cup is uh, TFM or, or, or paraflon that has a Viton insert. So when the bonnet of the valve is bolted to the uh, valve body, the belt Belleville washers will compress through a uh, pusher onto the Viton insert. Uh, when the Viton is compressed, it, it acts kind of like uh, kind of like a hydraulic oil, and you get a compression seal both outward on the valve body and in towards the, the, the stem. Uh, you can also notice the the ribs on the seal. If you didn't have the ribs, the, the sealing force would be working, you know, on the tire area, uh, so you would end up having a much smaller uh, sealing pressure. Uh, and here you have the, uh, you can see that the mechanically locked valve lining. This is achieved with, you know, as we talked earlier about the dovetail grooves in the valve. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's very important uh, for dimensional stability as well as uh, vacuum applications. Uh, 
We also uh, we also have a standard port Teflon line bulb out here. Once again, you can get it uh, manual or fully automated as well. Uh, this is our BFE. It's a Teflon line butterfly valve. This valve can you can be fully automated or, or come as a manual valve as well. Here, here are the components for the BFV. Uh, one thing I should mention here is even though we have a fully tough online valve, uh, you can get this valve with a titanium disc. Uh, in our industry, we see, we see this used in, in brine and, and wet chlorine gas a lot, uh, but most of the time it will be a, a totally tough online Teflon disc. Uh, just like the, the LBF, it has a dynamically loaded stem seal. Uh, you can see here the actual the the, the Belleville washers that are they're, they're kind of use they're act, actually used as spring. So as the the body halves are being bolted together, it compresses the Bellevilles, and as it compresses, it drives the force down through the through the valve body, uh, create a sealing force both radially and actually. Uh, the stem seal, as you see here, is identical both top and bottom. Uh, and most of the, the competition uh, competitors, they'll have a machine entry point entry point on the bottom of the of the valve with a cap. Uh, you see here at the bottom. Uh, we do not. You know, our piece is solid because we believe this is uh, this is a potential leak path. Uh, we did a, a case study with this valve at Honeywell and in guys from Louisiana. It was uh, it was put in an HF acid service which is a really difficult application honeywell was uh, was having to replace the butterfly valve they were the manufacturer they were using about every six months they have a turnaround every six months and they're having to replace it and uh, they put us up against four other four other manufacturers uh, over the course of uh, of a couple of years and uh, our valve has, has now been in service for three years there so uh, pretty big difference that's uh, Pretty good testimony to the valve there. This is our RSS and it's a globe valve. Uh, there's some pretty unique options here with uh, plug and, and flow curve applications that we, we need to accomplish with this valve. We have uh, custom designed plugs and, and we can maintain a CV value as low as 0 0.012. One of the, the main reasons we see this valve being used with uh, really low CV value is, is in HCL cell injection to control pH level and membrane units of, of a coring plant. Uh, the, the bellows uh, here is going to provide a hermetic seal from the, from the outside. So if the, if the bellows for some reason by chance gets damaged or tears there, you, know, you see there's a, a secondary seal in the stuffing box up top, uh, you know, you'll also you also have a, a bubble tight shut off with this valve, with the paraflon plug and the paraflon seat, and uh, both are both of these are interchangeable and and replaceable. Uh, this is our LDV series. We offer line metallic and composite diaphragm valve. It, it has a maintenance-free design, so once again, this will eliminate the need for, for inline adjustments. Uh, it has a self-draining. It's a totally dead space-free valve body design, to, and this will eliminate uh, product contamination. Uh, this, valve, this valve is ideally suited for vacuum and, and gas handling applications. Uh, here's our uh, LPG, which is uh, a plug valve. This valve is designed to offer long-term maintenance-free uh, security against uh, any any harmful effects of, of fugitive emissions, uh, and it's off it, it's offered as well in, in manual and, and fully uh, automated. Uh, here we have uh, we also offer uh, sample valves. Uh, these are closed loop. Inline valves that allows uh, the collection of samples of corrosive and in, in, in any toxic media. Uh, they are environmentally safe. It has a dead space free sample uh, 
that uh, can safely be taken directly from horizontal and, and uh, or vertical piping. Uh, and here we uh, we offer high performance line pipe and fittings. You know, we're as a company we're committed to quality assurance in, in our process, and this process is, has been audited and certified by ISO. 9001-2015 for quality management systems. And uh, there's a, a PED, you know, pressure equipment directive for uh, mechanical integrity. So uh, we take quality and uh, customer service very serious at Aegis. And uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, I wanna thank Peerless for the opportunity to present this and I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Um, thanks, Greg, for driving. Uh, right now, I'm going to turn this back over to Kevin. He's got a couple of slides to just get us wrapped up. Uh, we don't have any questions in the queue right now, um, but we will still be sticking around for another couple of minutes. So if there's anything um, on your mind, anything that we didn't cover, anything you want clarity on, uh, please you know, continue and feel free to submit a question now and, uh, and we'll get it covered. But yeah, for now, take it away, Kev. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, Johnny, as well. Um, sure was a whole lot of information in that uh, presentation. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, if anyone, ha again, has any further questions, uh, we're certainly here to help. Um, if anybody would like a certificate of completion, just either email one of us or answer that in the survey that will follow the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, as far as next week goes, we will have a seminar, a web, webinar on industrial host systems, and that will be done by one of our engineers here internally that spends a great deal of his time working on building uh, and app applying uh, hose assemblies. So uh, once again, we thank you for your participation. Johnny, uh, Sydney, really do appreciate it, and everyone have a good and safe week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.